So um, the uh, let's let's just finish wrap up the um, discussion on standardization. Um, so what's important for you uh, to remember is that you have uh, European uh, normalization uh, organization that uh, takes care of uh, steel um, in Europe. Uh, then Asia Pacific, you have uh, the Japanese industrial uh, standards for steels are widely used, and then in the in North America, uh, there are various uh, organizations that issue uh, standards. EISI is one of them. Uh, the Society of Automotive Engineers. And in the US, uh, you have very strong engineering societies that are specialized in uh, specific areas, technology areas, uh, that will have their own set of uh, specifications for uh, the steels they use. And, and uh, a famous one uh, in the petroleum industry is the American Petroleum Industry, API. Uh, and the API issues um, <coughs> uh, standards for steels that are only used in the, uh, in, the um, uh, in that industry, in the petroleum, gas and petroleum uh, industry. Um, so um, please try to remember a few of these uh, names as you, um, uh, certainly if you're in steel, uh, at G, uh, steel research at GNFT. There are other systems, uh, and I, I talked to you about the university, uh, universal uh, numbering system in the US uh, that exists uh, and um, it's uh, not very widely used. Um, in the US, as I said, you will have um, uh, AISI and SAE uh, that uh, issue uh, um, uh, steel grade standards. Um, uh, one of the uh, uh, important standards that uh, are associated with AISI are for stainless steels. Stainless steels, yeah. We don't discuss, as I said, stainless steels in, our, in, in this present course because there is a separate course on stainless steels being offered at GIFT, yes? Um, and uh, and there are very many different types of stainless steels, ferritics, austenitic, martensitics, duplex stainless steels. And um, the, uh, the AISI has a, a, a numbering system that is used worldwide in uh, Asia Pacific region in Europe. It's very uh, popular in the industry and you basically have numbers associated with the grades, the types of grade. For instance, all the austenitic stainless steels uh, are, have a, a number in the 300s. For instance, 304L is a common nickel chrome austenitic steel where L stands for low carbon. So again, um, uh, there you really need to know the numbers to um, uh, to know what, what grade, what chemistry uh, that steel has. Mm -hmm. But it's a very popular way of um, describing stainless steels, you know, this uh, AISI uh, specification. Mm -hmm. um, in uh, the US you have, uh, for construction and many engineering applications, 
the ASTM, it's again, it's a society, it's an engineering society, it's an American Society for Testing and Materials. They issue specifications where um, um, not only they, sp they specify the material, but also the way the material is to be tested for a particular application. Hmm? Hmm? So you have ASTM classifications which focus on the type of steel product applications. You have ASTM classifications will usually include uh, compositions and property specifications. And you can always recognize a ASTM uh, th uh, that uh, a document is referring to an ASTM specification for a steel or for a, a, a method to uh, test uh, materials, uh, they start with an A followed by a number. Okay? For instance, A36 is for structural steels. A131 is structural steels for ships. A709, structural steels for bridges. Okay? Um, and in the U.S. you have many other uh, organizations, as I said, uh, like the Society of Automotive Engineers, building cars and trucks and, and other uh, 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 vehicles, API for the petroleum industry. But you also have um, people, uh, industries that are uh, focusing on, on bridge construction, on highway construction. They have an American association with state highway and transportation officials that issue specifications for steels in that particular application. Um, the military in the U.S. has its own specifications for steels, like MIL slash S. Hmm? So MIL stands for military and S stands for steels, yes. Um, aerospace industry, uh, AMS, hmm? for instance, uh, you may not think there's much steel being used in, in aeroplanes, but all the, landing all the landing gears of airplanes are usually made out of steels. Yeah? So uh, the, the specifications for these steels are um, issued by AS AMS, hmm? the um, aerospace uh, industry, and then uh, API for uh, the American, plat uh, the American um, petroleum industry specification and ASME for boilers and pressure vessel uh, building, okay? So, finally, right, uh, we have uh, the ISO, is the International Standardization Organization, who also has, uh, uh, classifies almost every, anything and everything, certainly in terms of materials, yes, they also have, uh, classifications for, for steels, which are not widely used. So we're not, you know, I'm just going to mention them. You can read what's on the slide uh, yourself, but um, they're, they're, they're really not used. So, um, okay. Right, so um, to what is very important is that uh, most of you will become one day, hopefully, successful uh, professionals in the industry. Uh, whether it's related to steel or not doesn't really matter. Uh, but when you, uh, w when you are working according to standards or specifications, it's very important that your, your company has the specifications in its possession, right? Do not ever uh, take a textbook, yes, or my slides as specifications, right? right? You should buy them from these organizations or these uh, government organizations that issue the specifications, right? It's very important that you, you know and you read actually what the specification says. Yeah? Don't go on internet to get it for to get it for free, right? Uh, or from a Chinese producer or whatever, you know, who says this is the specifications are according to 
that's not, uh, so as uh, professionals in uh, materials industry, uh, it's important that you, you have the specification in your possessions. Hmm? And this is not, it's really important, I want to stress this, is really important because your company may one day have a, uh, a big problem. You, know, you have provided an industry with material and uh, an accident has happened or the material uh, has been deemed unacceptable by uh, the person, uh, the company you sold it to, yes? And you may end up with multi-million dollar uh, insurance claims, yes? You better, you better know what the specifications were of your material, yes? At that time, yes? So, um, and these things happen, yes? Uh, uh, and it can be very frustrating. Okay, so, so uh, we, won't, you know, we won't talk too much. That's it for standardization, but it's important for you that you know, uh, at this uh, stage you would know something about it. All right, so now we are um, moving on to um, production of uh, steels. Hmm? Um, as I said um, earlier on in uh, the course, we, we don't talk about what's happening in the blast furnace or an electrical arc furnace, electric arc furnace because there you basically make your base steel, yes? Um, and uh, it's in the secondary metallurgy where you define the steel composition. Uh, what really happens with the material is the production, and how you get the microstructure through processing. Hmm? So we'll start now with um, uh, focusing on uh, the conventional hot strip mill. Okay? And um, so what, what is uh, hot strip rolling? It's, it's a process where you, you start from a slab and uh, you, um, you, you, uh, you roll it. Hmm? at a temperature at which it, uh, it recrystallizes. Hmm? Uh, so we deform the material hmm? and we, during the deformation we adjust the austenite grain size yeah, so that it's uh, suitable for the downstream hmm, uh, processing. Hmm? At the end, uh, what, or what comes out basically of a hot strip mill is uh, a semi-finished product, it's a steel core. Hmm? So we'll, we'll be talking about the general principles of the hot strip mill, and then we'll go through all the elements of, uh, the, that are of importance to the product. Hmm? Okay, right. So um, first some general things about, similar points about metal working, machining, right? Um, the things you have to look at the process are strain rates, you know, how fast do we deform things, the temperature at which we do the, um, the metal working, and the amount of deformation we give to the material during the, the process. You know. And in metal working, the strain rates can be very, very, uh, very different. You know. We can have literally 10 to the minus 12 you know, to 10 to the fifth per second. Hmm? Um, in metal forming, we'll be on the upper side of this range, yes? Uh, on uh, methods which rely more on uh, like s slow extrusions, we'll be on the lower side of these uh, strain rates. The temperatures go from room temperature, then we talk about cold working, Warm working, if we are in the creep regime, yes, that is below the recrystallization temperature. Hmm? And hot working, when we are above the recrystallization temperature. Hmm? And uh, for extrusion processes, yes, we need very soft material just so we can uh, have an even higher temperatures. The strains, again, uh, if we have uh, plastic strains, they will tend to be relatively large. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the, in metal working, the elastic strains are not very 
are not very large at all and we generally can neglect them in relation to the uh, in comparison to the plastic strains mm -hmm. so this is now here you can see a table of different metal working uh, methods cold working wire drawing machining warm uh, rolling or forging and and hot rolling or forging and you can see that the strain rates, uh, excuse me, the, the strains, the amount of strains we have are uh, 0.1 to 0.5. Generally, 0.5 is a maximum. Um, the velocity ranges, that means how fast we deform them, how fast we process the material, can be anywhere from uh, 0.1 meters per second to 100 meters per second. Yeah? And the strain rates, this is maybe of interest. So in cold working, can be up to uh, two times ten to the th uh, third. In wire drawing, uh, we have one of the highest uh, strain rates in metal forming. Can be ten to the fourth, close to ten to the fifth per second. Yes. In um, uh, and the same in machining. In uh, warm working and hot working our strain rates will be anywhere from 1 to 10 to the third uh, on the higher end. Um, I want to uh, just take a moment to remind you that uh, in the lab, when we test materials, our strain rates are much lower. Right? We, we use strain rates of typically 10 to minus 3. Yes. So when we test materials in the lab to look at their suitability for an application, yes, um, we, we're testing them in the lab. It doesn't mean that you know, the data we find yes, is uh, in any way representative for, for the way the material will behave uh, during processing or during a, a specific application. Okay? So be careful uh, with that. Okay? Um, Right, so about the temperatures, hmm? cold working obviously is at room temperature, but when you deform a material, certainly when you deform it a lot, uh, what happens to the energy you supply to the material, right? So you deform, you get a shape change of the material, yes, and most of the energy gets transferred into heat, becomes heat, yes? Uh, about 90% of the energy uh, is heat, it's turned into heat. Yeah? And uh, what happens to the, the, the 10 other percent? Well, they become lattice defects, dislocations, yeah? uh, basically. And um, so that means that the temperature will increase and, uh, and if there is no removal of heat, you get what's called adiabatic heating of the, uh, the uh, material. That can be considerable, yes? Uh, there are materials uh, where even deforming at very low strain rates will increase the temperature to 100 degrees C. So you can actually uh, hurt yourself by touching the sample. Right? So it's, it's, it's considerable. Never touch a cold royal coil. Right? When it's freshly cold rolled, it's very hot. Yes? Even though it's cold rolled. Yeah? Okay? Uh, so don't uh, underestimate this, uh, this factor here. But the heating effects, for instance, steel, heavily cold rolled, you're looking at 100, maybe 150 degrees C. Hmm? Okay. Um, while you're drawing, uh, uh, slightly heated to 30% uh, of the melting temperature, machining similarly, and in all these cases, uh, you, can, you have adiabatic heating. Warm working is uh, below uh, half of the melting temperature, and hot uh, working is above half of the melting temperature. Mm -hmm. right. So, um, whereby a melting temperature is the melting temperature in Kelvin. Right, so what's the, are there some fundamental differences between cold rolling and uh, warm rolling? Uh, why would you do, why wouldn't you do always hot rolling? It's a good question. Well, 
cold rolling gives you a much better precision of the rolling process hmm? and a much better surface finish than hot or warm rolling. Yes? Um, and because you're working at low temperature, there's no oxidation hmm, of thermal oxidation of the surface. Hmm? So you don't damage the surface. Hmm? The velocities of rolling, so the deformations, can be very high. Strain rates can be very high, up to 100 meters per second. And the reductions are uh, generally small, uh, and we get strain rates which, which can still be appreciable from uh, 1 0.1 to 10 to the thirds per second. Hot rolling, hmm, we generally give larger reductions, yes, um, and we have lower rolling forces. Yeah? I'll, I'll show you some data in a moment. And of course, a typical example is uh, steel slabs rolling which are reheated to 1250, yes? And you, every time you roll them, you give reductions of 10 to 50% per pass. And the reductions, the, the strain rates that you use are relatively small. So you, you have velocity, strip velocities of the order of one meters per second. Hmm? And forging is comparable to hot rolling. Hmm? If you want to compute uh, or have an idea of what is the uh, the strain rate of a, a process like, uh, such as uh, hot rolling, mm, you, you have an entry thickness T0, an exit thickness T1, the strip comes out at a certain velocity V, yes, and you have a contact uh, uh, range of L, yes. So the rate, strain rate, is the strain divided by the time of that the deformation takes. And the strain is, um, the true strain is a uh, natural logarithm of in entry to exit uh, thickness. And the time you do the deformation is, of course, the contact length divided by the velocity. That gives you a time, yes? And so uh, that's the strain rate, okay? In contrast, uh, let's look at uh, wire drawing. Mm, there you have very high wire speeds, yes? Uh, and uh, so you basically pull a, a wire through a lubricated die here, yes? And at the, the strain rates are very high. Mm. The contact lengths here, the contact lengths are very short, yes? Uh, one to 10 millimeters, yeah, which is uh, very much larger than, for instance, the case of rolling. And um, we have, during wire drawing, which is a cold process, we have appreciable uh, heating. And due to uh, two things in this process, first of all, you have the adiabatic heating due to the plastic deformation, but you also have a lot of frictional heating, the, f at the, f the friction here. In this case, it's it very important. Hmm? And similarly, for the, as for the rolling, you can uh, calculate the strain rates as being the natural logarithm of the incoming uh, diameter of the uh, wire divided by the exit, divided by the, uh, l the contact uh, length, divided by the velocity of the wire, and that will give you the strain rates. So um, where do we put the, uh, the boundary between uh, hot rolling and cold rolling? Hmm? Uh, where does the hot come from in hot strip mill? Well, uh, recrystallization temperature of steel is about, is in the range of 550 to 600 degrees C. So the, um, and that's about half of the melting temperature in Kelvin. The melting temperature, 1536 plus 273 to get it in Kelvin. Divide this by two, and you get that temperature, 632. Okay? It's important temperature, yes, for you to know and to remember, certainly if you're in steel research, if you want to recrystallize something, uh, don't do it at uh, lower temperatures because it will take forever. Yes? So you need to have 650 at least, okay?
Anything that happens below that, uh, the material will get softer, but it will not recrystallize. You'll get recovery. Okay. Right. So anyway, so to get to this temperature, we have to uh, add energy. Yes, and of course, uh, when we deform the material, it will recrystallize. And I've already told you a few times uh, that uh, recrystallization at high temperatures is a very, very fast, very kinetic process. Very high. Um, so it takes just a few seconds, less than a second, excuse me, to, uh, to recrystallize. In the case of cold working, uh, we don't add any heat. So the only heating comes from adiabatic heating. And uh, when we uh, deform the material, it doesn't recrystallize. Okay? So uh, this is shown in this uh, uh, schematic here. So in hot rolling, you have coarse austenite grain. You roll them, when you roll them, um, they're pancaked, yes? But during the deformation passes, that time is called the interpass time, hmm? uh, the grains will recrystallize very quickly. Hmm? Very quickly. So you get smaller austenite grains, yes, uh, that are recrystallized. And that goes into the next deformation pass, and again you get pancake grains that will recrystallize. Huh? In the case, so, so the material gets, becomes a little harder, but not so much. And the, the main reason why it gets harder is because the temperature is dropping, not because the microstructure is refined or anything. Huh? In the case of cold rolling, it's very different. Yes, um, we, are, we start with uh, ferrite grains, yes. We pancake them, nothing happens, yes. So, we g they go through the next stage, again, pancake. So what happens? You are straining the material. You're pumping dislocations in the material a lot and more and more, yes, dislocation. So the material becomes harder and harder and harder as you do the rolling, yes? Very, very much harder, yes? And at the end of the hot rolling, you basically have a recrystallized a coil consisting most, certainly for the low carbon seal, recrystallized microstructure that's soft, yes? In the case of uh, cold rolling, you have a highly deformed, yes, ferrite microstructure, basically. It's very hard. You cannot do anything with it. Yes? And that's also not a big difference between hot deformation and cold deformation, okay? Is that uh, in the case of cold rolling, you will have to apply some thermal treatment to recrystallize the microstructure. In the case of hot strip, you don't need to do this. You don't need to recrystallize the material. Okay, so let's have a look now at some numbers. Um, and uh, one of the reasons why we do uh, hot deformation is because the material is much softer at high temperature. Yeah? And uh, so we can apply a lot of deformation, yes, with a reasonable force. So let's look at the flow stress of a steel and using a, a strain rate of 10 per second. So that's it's higher than you, what you would do in, in, the, in, the, in the lab with a, a tensile test, right? So at 700 degrees C, we have about 300 megapascal, yes? And um, usually when we do deform steels, carbon steels, uh, in the hot strip mill, we do this between, uh, in the range of 1100 to 900, yes? And you can see here, that depending, of course, on the amount of strain we give, but the amount of strain is usually in this area, like point, point 0.2 to point 0.3 uh, strain, you see that the, the strength is typically below 200 megapascal hmm, and can be as low as 100 megapascal. Hmm. So it's very soft, yes, very soft. Hmm. We have to, uh, of course, 
as the temperature drops, the material becomes stronger. Yes? Not because anything happens to the microstructure, just because the material is, is stronger. Yes? And so if you would look now at the flow stress as a function of temperature, and this gray bar here uh, is the temperatures at which we roll carbon steels in a hot strip mill, we see that the material, uh, the flow stress increases from about 100 megapascal to about 200 megapascal. Hmm? What happens as we go uh, lower, something interesting happens. We go lower, uh, there is a dip here. Yes? And this dip, that's because for this particular uh, uh, carbon steel, the transformation starts. Yes? And at high temperature, the austenite is harder, is stronger than ferrite. So um, there is a dip here in the flow strength of the material. Um, this kind of difference in behavior can, for instance, be observed when you do torsion tests. Hmm? For instance, this is a torsion test at 1200 degrees C, yes? And I have two different steels. One is a ferritic steel at, that's ferritic at 1200 degrees C, and another one is an austenitic steel that's uh, austenitic at, high, at that temperature, pure austenite, okay? And you can see very big difference in the, the, the flow strength of the material. Ferrite, 40 megapascal, yes, of uh, stress. The austenite, much larger, okay? It's, that is important. For carbon steels, you, you may ask yourself, well, why don't we, can we use this for carbon steels? Not really, because as you can see, the austenite at this temperature, at this high temperature, is still softer than the ferrite at this temperature. Right? So there's no, no real point in, uh, in going to lower temperatures to use to deform a softer ferrite, okay? But in, there are some steels, um, the, the stainless steels, yes, where we have, where we can have uh, a ferritic uh, microstructure at high temperature. Okay? And, uh, and so and in this case, it does make a big difference whether you're processing ferritic steels or austenitic steels. Hmm? This is an example here of production data for stainless steel. So this is the, the flow stress as a function of the temperature. And you have a, a band here in the middle, yes? Um, let's, let's look at uh, the red uh, squares here. It's 316, yeah? and the um, orange squares is, are 304. Those are uh, very common chrome nickel austenitic steels, and you can see the flow stress increasing as the temperature uh, decreases. And um, if you compare now with a ferritic stainless steel, which only contains chrome, no nickel, that's the 409 here, you see that this is this flow stress. So it's much lower, it's much lower. And um, uh, this is, for instance, uh, an, an austenite, which contains 23% uh, of uh, chrome and 5% of nickel. You can see it's even higher in strength, okay? So, so there is this difference. In the case of carbon steels, we cannot really exploit it, yes, because uh, by the time we reach the transformation temperature, yes, the, the strength of the ferrite is already too high, okay? Okay, so these are just a couple of background uh, points to uh, 
uh, about the material, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll give more details as, as, we, um, as we go. But now we want to focus on, on the, the production uh, uh, site. Hmm? So first of all, um, when uh, hot strips mills are designed, yes, they are designed, they're, they're, they're first of all commissioned, uh, designed and commissioned to address a, uh, a need for steels, yes? It's, it's, at the end of the day, it's a product, right? So hot strip mills do not make steels for the cold strip mill, right? Very often you go visit a big plant, yes, and uh, the client of the hot strip mill seems to be the cold strip mill, yeah? That's not the client. Uh, the client is our consumers of steel, yeah? And they have very high demands in terms of properties of the material, in terms of quality, in terms of consistency in property and quality. Hmm? So the elements, how, how we decide, make decisions about what technology to install deter, is, is very much determined on the product mix that the hot strip mill is supposed to uh, deliver. Hmm? So, and that will determine uh, the size, the dimensions of the machines and the motors, yes, uh, the automation, yes, uh, whether or not we have uh, control systems that are adaptive that are or not. It depends on many things. On, on the, the, uh, these parameters depend on what uh, products we want to make. And uh, for instance, these are two product mixes of different hot strip mills. Yeah, this is one and this is another one. And you can see they're, they're very different. In one case here, we, we see a company or a plant that makes essentially carbon steels only. Yeah? Uh, and uh, relatively high quality, you see Lots of IF steels, interstitial free steels, very low carbon and nitrogen. Very formable low carbon steels. Some constructional steels. Tin plate for uh, packaging. Mm -hmm. Some micro alloy steels. So this is probably a plant that uh, provides uh, material, hot roll strip, that will eventually go into automotive industry. Yeah? This one, this uh, hot strip mill, about half the production is formable steels and carbon steels. A lot of it is also stainless steels. So they have a much wider customer base, yes? And they have to address uh, uh, the processing of, of steels with many different properties, okay? All right, so um, The modern, so-called uh, fourth, we, the modern hot strip mills are called fourth generation hot strip mills. Yes, um, and uh, they date. You know, the, the design is about is a few decades old. There are lots of variants on them. We'll discuss them, but they, you know, very comparable. Yes, and um, how do you compare them? So here you have three hot strip mills: one, two, and three. You have, first of all, the, the slab size. Hmm? So slabs are usually, the, the, the width is very important because cer certain uh, users need very large widths, others uh, don't, yes. Um, so 600 to uh, 1620 millimeters, the hot strip mill two goes up to two meters, 2.2 meters, yes. And hot strip mill three, uh, 900 to uh, 1930 millimeters. So de de depending on the demands of the, your clients, uh, if you have a wider, uh, if, if your clients demand wider strip, yes, your rolling stands will also have to be wider. Hmm? Because obviously you cannot, if, if your uh, stands are dimensioned for uh, 1.8, uh, wide strip, you cannot make two meters wide strip, okay? So, uh, very important. The length uh, is, uh, for instance here, uh, ten, close to 10 meters. This one's 15 meters maximum. 
and here 12 meters, yes? You'd say, well, you know, what, what's, is this important? Yes, because the longer you, you can, your, uh, the longer your um, slab is, the heavier it is, the heavier it is. So, and if you make things heavy, yeah, at the beginning, they'll also, you know, usually you make, you turn one slab into one coil, yes? So if you have a, uh, 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 a t typically like a 23-ton uh, coil, yes, uh, the equipment you install has to be able to lift this type of weight, yes? Okay? Okay, so this... Uh, and of course, uh, 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 if you need to install more power, things will be more expensive. You will be using more uh, electricity. It will be more costly to uh, do the um, to look after the equipment, etc. So all these, uh, uh, you know, the, the needs of the market and the customers will, you know, will very much depend. Uh, or, or control, you know, the technical decisions you make. Hmm? Uh, thickness of the uh, strip um, is typically goes from uh, 1.5 millimeters. That's a very low value. Uh, very few people can reach this. Um, typically, um, we are around uh, five to ten to 12 millimeters. That's the, the typical thickness of the end uh, material. So, so you, you basically start with slabs that can um, that typically are 20 to 25 centimeters in thickness, yeah? Yes. And you end up with products that, you know, that will have five millimeters in thickness. Mm -hmm. So, Okay, the weights, uh, again, maximum weights uh, are installed uh, when you will have, um, if, if you supply big clients, yes, you can make big coils, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, obviously, uh, these two hot strip mills uh, are able to handle big coils, yes? The orders are very large, yes, and uh, so they have larger uh, coils, for instance, coil weights. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so we typically have, uh, yeah, what we call specific weight. I'll, 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 I'll say a few things about this, which are of the order of 20 kilograms per meter. You'll, you'll see what we mean with this. Uh, yeah. And uh, production rates are also important. Yes, how much, how productive do you want to uh, make your hot strip mill? So in this case, the maximum speed at exit is 15 meters per second, and here it can go up to uh, close to 24 meters per second. Uh, I want to let you know that uh, 10 meters per second is about 40, uh, uh, 36 kilometers per hour. So uh, this line uh, can, you know, the exit uh, sp uh, strip speed can you know, um, easily be 60 kilometers per hour. So that's very fast, the, the production rates. And production capacities of fourth generation hot strip mills is typically four to about five million tons of steel per year. Mm, that's the kind of units we're talking about. So that's a huge amount of material, okay? So these fourth generation hot strip mills, uh, they're still the, the main technology today. Uh, the, the original designs come from the 1980s. Higher quality, uh, very efficient in terms of costs, although there are new technologies which we'll be discussing in the course of the lectures. They have uh, special roughers. Uh, uh, they have walking beam furnaces, which we will discuss. We have the possibility of heavy edging. Heavy edging means that you can change the width 
of your uh, hot strip easily. Oh, of course, limited range, but you can change it. Um, and you have hydraulic automatic gauge control. You have roll bending, roll shifting, yes, cross pair technologies in lines that allows you to uh, control the strip profile, yes, very well. And we'll discuss this technology in uh, some detail. And then um, uh, you have all kinds of technologies in lines which will make sure that the thermal history, the thermal uh, treatment that you apply to your steels is, is such that there are very little uh, uh, thermal gradients in your materials. One of these technologies is the coil box technology. So we'll go into that in a moment. So uh, we will focus in uh, lecture today and, and lecture uh, next week and, and probably um, uh, the next lecture after that on these hot strip mills because they're, they're not the only technology that's out there. You have different types of uh, hot strip mills like stackle mills and mini mills which we will discuss. Uh, but the continuous hot strip mill is, is a very prevalent technology uh, globally. So you need to uh, be uh, well informed about these, um, these hot strip mills. Hmm? So the what's, what's the general picture like? Hmm? We have a continuous caster hmm? which uh, casts the materials into slabs. Yes, This material is usually... Uh, let to cool in a uh, and the slabs are then picked up, reheated, rough rolled, hot rolled, and then you had hot rolled coils. Yes, this is already a marketable product. Yes, so uh, there are industries who use this to make uh, trucks, hmm? truck frames. Yes, for instance, or uh, there are uh, the companies that will re-roll this material, this hot rolled material, into uh, various types of cold rolled products. Mm -hmm. uh, or the company will continue processing this hot rolled product and end up with cold rolled uh, coil or cold rolled sheets uh, to be used in various industries. Mm -hmm. So we usually talk, when we, we talk about the products, that a company make, yes, we, we talk about uh, things like uh, sections and semis and flat products and uh, sheet, yes. So I want to go a little bit, talk a little bit about uh, the vocabulary that, that we use with steel products. Right? Okay. So in general, we talk about semi-finished or finished products. Yeah? And when we say semi-finished, we usually mean slabs, blooms, or billets. And slab, blooms, or billets is, is basically what comes out of the continuous caster. Yes? So there is a big uh, trade in slabs in the world. You know, people buy slabs to use in their hot strip mill. Yes? Not every steel maker in the world is as large as POSCO. Yes? And, and some people just buy their steel left and right on the open market. Uh, and, and of course, uh, there are different sizes of uh, continuous cast products. We'll say a few words about this. This is blooms, and, and, and so you get blooms and billets also in addition to the slab. The finished products are divided in sections. Hmm? What are sections? Well, bars, beams, wires, rails, those are sections. Hmm? Uh, in uh, certain people call them also long products, hmm? long products with a specific section. And the other finished uh, products are the flat products. Okay, so they're two dimensionals. Yeah? And when they are thick, yes, they're two dimensional, thick, more than three millimeters, or yeah, we call them plates. And if it's less than three millimeters, 
we call them strip, yes? And, okay? The semi-finished are shown here, the slab blooms and billets, and then you have the flat products, yes? And then the sections, okay? And you can see the flat products are two-dimensional things, yes? And there are some, of course, confusing things in the industry, in particular when it comes to pipe, yes? There are certain pipes that we, that are welded pipes, yes? And for that we use flat rolled products to make them, yes? Plate or sheet, depending on the type of uh, pipes we want to make. But we also make uh, seamless pipes, yeah? And those are made, for instance, uh, from rounds, round billets, yeah, round billets that are perforated uh, in this special uh, process which we will discuss hmm? later, okay? So with pipe, it's a little bit difficult to say uh, where they belong, but basically you have to say, well, whether you are talking about uh, welded pipe or, or seamless pipe. Okay, so we, you've seen that other than uh, slabs, we have uh, billets and blooms, right? Okay, and, and obviously if I show you this picture, you can, you can see that uh, yeah, the billet is more rectangular and, and the, bloom, uh, the, the bloom is more rectangular and, and the billet is kind of squarish and longer or whatever. Uh, but, you know, what, where, you know, it's basically totally arbitrary what we call a bloom and a billet. Huh? And so it's about at, uh, when, when something is larger than seven by seven inch or uh, about 18 centimeters by 18 centimeters, if it's larger than that, we call it bloom. If it's lower than that, we call it the billet. Hmm? And in general, billets are 10 to 12 centimeters in size, okay? But don't call a bloom a billet. Don't call a billet a slab, yes? You will uh, embarrass yourself if you visit a steel plant. So try to remember. Right, so, so um, and of course, uh, what defines the size of uh, slabs, blooms, and billets is basically a continuous caster, hmm? okay? So, um, so here you have a picture of a double strand caster, hmm? uh, 1400 wide, hmm? thickness 23 centimeters, yes? And this caster can produce about 2 million tons of steel, 1.8 million tons of steel per year, okay? So, uh, a slab has a width typically larger than 60 centimeters, yes? And uh, uh, no, and the width should be larger than two or three times the thickness. Okay. Uh, so the, you have uh, middle, you have the, the blue, yes? Um, right, now there's, in the past, I, I want, to, because I, um, in the past, all these shapes, yes, were, were, were not produced uh, from a continuous caster, but were produced from ingot cast material, yes? And so you, you, you needed to have a, a forging, a, a kind of forging process, yes, to shape your continuous, your, your ingot into the slab, the bloom, or the billet shape, yes? No, nowadays, you cast it in this shape, yes? Continuously. In the past, you had to forge it into this shape, yes? And that was done with a blooming mill. Now, nowadays, only, well, uh, th there still exist blooming mills, but in the past, they used to be very common. Nowadays, they're very rare, and very often in older companies, older plants will have blooming mills, yeah? Uh, so that's, that's what uh, I write next to ingot blooming, that's the meaning of this. You, it's technology you don't see very often anymore. Hmm? 
Uh, so the strip gets uh, cast continuously and then you cut it with an, uh, uh, a flame cutter. Hmm? And, and this is another caster here which makes billets. Uh, so this is a, a, a three, three strands caster uh, for round products. Yeah? Okay. So you produce the, 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 uh, the size. Yeah? Okay. And of course, um, you, uh, in, in this case, you see a four strand uh, caster and you can see it's not round it's it's the square billets right? okay okay right so a uh, few more words here vocabulary that may be of interest uh, we have s the word slab is basically a rectangular uh, piece of steel yes uh, 25 20 to 25 centimeter thickness, about 10 meters in length. Uh, uh, what do we call a bar? Yes, a bar is a very common word in a hot strip mill. That is a slab after it has been rolled by the roughing mill. Yes, in the hot strip mill, we have two parts in the rolling process. We have what's called the rough rolling and the finish rolling. Yeah? So at the beginning, we call the material, we call it a slab, yes? Mm -hmm. And at the end, the material is coiled, yes? And we call it strip. Well now, in between, you, the material also has a name. Hmm? It has, it's called bar. Hmm? Bar. And uh, I like to uh, mention this word because if you ever do research with uh, materials research with the steel industry, yes, and uh, you have to ask for samples, right, then this is the material you should ask for hmm? uh, because it's easily accessible. It's very hard to take samples from the slab. Forget it. Yeah? Same thing with the strip. It's difficult. However, when after the roughing mill, yes, the the end the end of the uh, uh, bars yes the ends of the bars so this is the end and the beginning very often they're not they're not like this they don't have this nice straight edge they have this curved edge which we call a, a tongue or uh, it can be a fish tail kind of edge, yes? And you cannot have this or this enter the finishing mill. So what do you do? It's always cut off. So they always cut this off, right? And they collect it. So you always t get, can get samples. Right? The only thing you need to have is some guy who will pick it up and you know, put it aside. Yes? But they don't have to make a special effort. Yes? So remember that. Uh, that's the way to get samples. Yes? Because they always cut these ends anyway. Mm -hmm. so, okay, a uh, strip is the bar after it's thin enough so you can uh, wrap it around a, a mandrel, you can coil it. A coil is a wrapped strip. A VSB is a vertical scale breaker. Mm, it's a large mill that, can, uh, that reduces the slab width but also removes scale. 
scale is oxide. Yeah, it's oxide. We'll talk about oxide formation uh, as we go. An edger is a small vertical uh, rolling mill that maintains the width of the bar. And there are different stands in the, uh, in the hot strip mill. Yes? There are different stands or there are different rolling steps. Yes? And in order to know, in order to designate them, we use symbol R, 1, R2, and so on. Yeah. That refers, it's this, this R in designs is, is the roughing mill stance. Yeah. And when you see F1, F2, uh, F7, yeah, sometimes there are quite a few stands here. Um, that is the designation of the finishing stance, okay? So in the industry, it's very common that people refer to you know, having problems in F2 or F3 or you know, have, using some reduction in R4, okay? And to descale, when we talk about descaling, that means we remove the oxide with high pressure water, yes? And of course, you can imagine that in the hot strip mill, managing uh, scale will be very important mm, because uh, at this high temperature, you readily form oxide very rapidly at the surface of your steel. And there are a number of other critical points, uh, uh, critical points we will uh, discuss as we go related to reductions with tolerances are very important in products. And things that are related to strip profile, the crown, the flatness of strip, the surface of the strip, we'll talk about these points also as we go. So this uh, is a typical uh, standard fourth generation uh, hot strip mill configuration. It starts with reheating furnace, out of the reheater furnace you have a descaler, then you have a sizing edger, roughing mills, usually one or two stands, okay. so in this case two stands. What comes out of the roughing mill is a transfer bar, yes? You go through a shear to remove start uh, head <coughs> and tail of your bar, yes? a descaler again to remove the oxides, and then a finishing mill, anywhere from five to seven stands, hmm? depending on what, uh, again, what your uh, product requirements are. Then a, a cooling run-out table and coilers, hmm? and then you get strip. Hmm? Oh, okay, let me just uh, go back a little bit here hmm? as we finish. Um, I want to point out the fact that uh, this distance uh, looks rather small. Yeah? It's actually very, very large. It's a very large, yes, because the bar, yes, the bar thickness, uh, you typically go from 25 uh, centimeters yeah, to 5 centimeters in thickness. 5 centimeters and then to five millimeters, right? So your, your slab that was initially 10 meters long is now, yeah, much longer, right? So you need to uh, have space between uh, the two, yes? It's actually, uh, Yes, so, so anywhere the, the, the um, uh, yeah, so it was 25 uh, centimeters, so it's five, so it's a good 50 meters. It can go up to 100 meters, yes, depending on, uh, you know, your, your thickness of pressure. So you need lots of space, yeah, there. So uh, this uh, part is very long, you can see, uh, uh, 
about 120 meters, yes? And this part where you do the cooling is also very long, about 180 meters. Yeah? So the, the whole uh, plant is, is very long too. An alternative configuration looks similar. You have a reheating furnace, descaling, roughing mill, only one roughing mill in this case, and then a coil box. Yeah? And you see that in this coil box, the, the, the bar or the so-called transfer bar is coiled into a box yes, and uncoiled to do the finishing. All right? Good. So I've come to... Uh, 12.15, so that's end of the lecture today. And we'll continue with uh, hot strip mail on, uh, on Monday. Thank you. <laughs>